record. We'll just give it one minute for everyone to join. Sure. Sure. Okay, Esther, if you want to go ahead, I think. Yeah, thank you, Dad. Hi, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the today's webinar on the prevention of pain after surgery. My name is Esther pogatsky zahn and I'm one of the co-chairs of the 2020 Global Year for the Prevention of Pain. The goal of this Global Year is to give an overview about preventive strategies that are able to protect against the onset of pain, prevent pain from becoming chronic or recurrent, and reduce the long-term consequences of pain. In addition, we hope to raise awareness that preventing pain and its consequences is at least as important as treating pain. So today we will talk about prevention of pain after surgery, and I would like to pass over to Jeanette, guest from ISP, and she will moderate our today's webinar. Thank you, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. On behalf of IASP, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is one in a series of webinars related to the Global Year for the Prevention of Pain. Before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to bring your attention to some information that appears on this slide. There are several ways to participate in the webinar today. After the talks, we will have a Q&A session and you can type in your questions into the Q&A area of your Zoom meeting control panel window. You can submit questions at any time that you would like. We will also be recording this webinar and it will be available on the IASP website. You can also tweet using hashtag Global Year 2020 and follow IASP Pain on Twitter. I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Winfred Meisner. Meisner um, he was appointed the head of Jena University's Hospital Pain Unit in 1994 and head of the Palliative Care Department in 2009. Uh, he's also initiated and coordinated two large registries in the area of acute pain, QUIPS, and its international counterpart, Pain Out. These registries offer feedback and benchmarking of pain treatment outcomes and facilitate health service research. Um, in addition, he's the coordinator of the NeuroPain Project and he has broad teaching experience uh, in a very various areas um, of curriculum, such as perioperative care, palliative care, and medical communication and medical English. I'd like to welcome Dr. Meissner at this time. Yeah, hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, really exciting to be connected to so many uh, people. For me, it's the first time to do such a worldwide webinar. And I send my greetings here from Germany. We have a warm summer evening, in fact, a small thunderstorm just outside to everybody. Um, I would like to give you a very, very brief overview and summary on the topic of prediction and prevention of acute pain after surgery. And on my next slide, um, I, Janet, perhaps you can, yeah. You see my conflicts of interests and uh, the slide after, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, why is it so important to discuss prevention and prediction of acute pain? On one side, um, 
post-surgical pain is a normal warning sign. And it's an important sign to give attention to um, some complications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other side, if post-operative pain is really severe and poorly treated, it may cause uh, quite a lot of negative consequences. Um, just to uh, mention some of them, we know meanwhile that uh, the um, cardiopulmonary problems might be increased in poorly controlled post-operative pain. Um, there are some nice studies having shown that also surgical complications can in be increased, specifically infections after um, um, severe pain uh, after surgery, uh, length of stay, delay of uh, going back to work can be um, impaired in patients having severe pain after surgery. And, and this will be the topic of Esther's talk later on. Um, we also know that acute pain is closely associated with increased incidence of chronic pain after surgery. But even if nothing of these complications may occur, from my point of view, it's an ethical uh, obligation to treat post of pain because otherwise patients suffer. Next slide, please. On the next slide, uh, you can see that um, I will show you um, some uh, very basic arguments why it's so important to deal with this topic and to try to predict acute post of pain. Um, if we know predictive factors, it might be um, possible to identify what we call patients at risk, patients at risk to develop severe post of pain. This allows to plan anesthesia, uh, surgery, and pain management to use some of those interventions which are known to decrease post of pain um, and and also allows to follow up these patients at risk, to visit them after surgery, for example, to send acute pain service to these patients and to inform patients, also healthcare providers, GPs, that these patients might develop some of these complications. These are the reasons why it is important to try to uh, predict or to identify patients at risk and therefore we need to know the what we call predictive uh, variables or predictive factors. Next slide, please. We can separate predictive parameters into two groups. There are complications, but I like this separation into patient-related factors. Winfred, I think we lost you a little bit. Can you get closer to your computer? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I I don't know what happened. I didn't touch my computer. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay. So we can separate uh, predictive factors into patient-related factors and surgery related factors. And the next slide will show a famous study, which I like quite a lot. This uh, study was published last year in the British Medical Journal. It is a meta-analysis meta -analysis, um, showing the um, factors or variables which might predict severe Post of uh, operative pain and poor post operative pain control. It summarized 33 studies with altogether more than 50,000 patients. And on the next slide, please, you can see the most important risk factors identified in this meta analysis. It is younger age, female sex, smoking. Um, it's history of depression, history of anxiety. There, there are two studies showing that also sleep difficulty might be a risk. Um, the um, body mass index um, was 
um, a very had a minor impact. The presence of preoperative pain and the preoperative intake of analgesics were also associated with severe post-operative post pain. On the next slide, um, I would like to show you another study which was done with our database, the Pain Out database. In this study, uh, Hans Gerbershagen has analyzed 22,000 patients in 30 different surgeries and the, um, uh, he was looking on uh, the impact of gender, of age, and of preoperative pain. And you can see the results on the next slide. Um, and what you can see, next slide please, is a clear relation on one side. No, this was too, too fast. Please one slide back. Jeanette, can you hear me? Yeah, you can see a clear relation between younger age on one side and more severe pain. This is on the x-axis. You can see the age on the x-axis. Um, uh, on the left side, you see the male patients. On the right side, the female patients. And here you can also see a slight difference. Female patients have reported a little bit more pain, but most experts today think this is not clinically relevant. And the third factor was the preoperative chronic pain. And again, you can see these are the green colors, the green columns. Patients with preoperative chronic pain had much, much more pain uh, or quite a lot of more intense pain after surgery compared to patients without chronic pain. On the next slide, I summarize the patient related factors, younger age pre-existing pain, pre-existing pain medication, and some studies have shown that specifically opioids play a major role in uh, this, um, uh, in increasing post-operative pain. Depression, anxiety, or catastrophizing, and perhaps something uh, like sleep disorder and smoking, these seem to be the most important patient-related prevent predictive factors for severe post-operative pain. The next slide will show you surgery-related factors. This was again an analysis of pain out data. Um, altogether 50,000 patients were analyzed and grouped into 179 surgical um, or types of um, surgeries. And it, uh, Hans Gerbershagen and his group, they did something like a ranking list of the most painful surgeries. And what uh, turned out on this study, the next slide please, was that sometimes incision size and also the tissue trauma was not related to the post-operative pain intensity. And pain intensity after some so-called small surgeries were much, much higher than expected. For example, pain after appendectomy or pain after tonsillectomy. And the group also compared laparoscopic surgeries versus open surgeries. In most of these surgeries, laparoscopic uh, approaches were related with less pain, but this was not the case always. Um, so this study showed us that it's not always um, or that the surgery, size of surgery cannot always predict the intense, intensity of post of pain. And this, what we call ranking list, can also help to identify patients and surgeries with an increased risk of post of pain. Next slide, please. So taken together, uh, we have Winfrey, we lost you. Oh, there we go. Me? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, so.
sorry, we still can't hear you. It's not better? No. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. Sorry for this. I don't know what happens. I do nothing with my phone, so it works all the time. Okay. Um, this is a summary of the two um, of the slides before. Uh, the patient-related factors, the most important are preoperative pain, preoperative analgesics, specifically opioids, younger age, and depression, anxiety, and catastrophizing. And on the surgery side, we have um, open surgery. We have some very painful so-called small surgery, which is um, very painful. And also many orthopedic surgeries have um, been shown to have um, very high pain intensity after surgery. I now come to my last slides. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. What can we do to prevent um, extreme pain or severe pain? So what should we do if we identify a patient with an increased risk to develop post-operative pain? Very generally, regional anesthesia techniques and analgesia techniques um, have been shown to be um, associated with less pain in almost all studies um, done in different types of surgery compared to general analgesia and systemic analgesia. Also, wound infiltration is often underestimated in its effect to um, reduce at least. We're unable to hear you again. I can hear you. Say again, now it's better. I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So preventive strategies, regional analgesia should be used. Um, wound infiltration should be used. Different types of analgesics should be combined. This is what we call multimodal analgesia. In, in so-called high-risk patients, so-called co-analgesics should be considered, like ketamine, like IV lidocaine, and uh, also like gabapentin or pregabalin. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, this study, um, again, done on pain out data, shows the impact of different pro, uh, pro, uh, protocol, pain protocols and also demographic factors. And it shows what happens in real life. These are 1,000 patients after orthopedic surgery, and the red circles are factors which are associated with um, poor pain control and the blue circles are uh, associated with better pain control. And I would like to draw your attention on the bl blue dot uh, on the right upper hand. Um, and uh, it turned out that in the real life data, the combination of two non-opioids during surgery, two non-opioid analgesic during surgeries had um, an additional impact to decrease acute post operative pain. On the other hand, it was also shown that the remifentanyl, the use of remifentanyl during surgery, had in uh, poor or was associated with poor pain control after surgery. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, this is my last slide. I would like to summarize. It is very important to identify patients with increased risk um, so that we can plan our um, anesthesia and pain management um, uh, interventions. Uh, we know that specifically preoperative pain, preoperative analgesics, specifically opioids, anxiety and depression are associated with uh, increased postoperative pain. And we know on the other side that some surgeries, some uh, specifically orthopedic surgery 
open surgery, but not always. And also some so-called minor surgery is associated with severe post-operative pain. The higher the risk, the more preventive action should be taken. And just to mention a few of these interventions, um, wound infiltration, regional analgesia, combination of different pain drugs, and specifically in so-called patients at risk, co-analgesics like ketamine and IV lidocaine have been shown to decrease um, post sort of pain. And, and I think this is very important. These patients should be followed up after surgery. So the anesthesiologist, the nurse, the acute pain service should visit these patients and look after them after surgery. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. I would now like to introduce our second presenter, Professor Dr. Esther pogatsky zahn Esther is an anesthesiologist, pain specialist, and professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Intensive Care, and Pain Medicine at the University Hospital in Munster. She works as a pain specialist clinically and leads the pain service in the hospital. In addition, she's the PI of the Pain Research Lab at the University of Munster. Please welcome Professor pogatsky zahn Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Win Winfried, for the nice talk uh, uh, and uh, talking nicely about uh, prediction and prevention of acute pain. Now I will talk uh, about prevention of chronic pain after surgery, and I will basically um, uh, introduce to you some studies about drugs and regional analgesia techniques. Um, the next slide uh, will, as Winfried showed you, my, uh, this will be my disclosure slide um, about um, company uh, um, scientific support and board council member. The next slide um, will introduce uh, you to the idea of chronic post-surgical and post-traumatic pain. Uh, I will uh, restrict my uh, talk uh, to post-surgical pain and not talking about post-traumatic pain. In fact, the latter one is really less well studied. Here is a definition and four points of a definition that is an updated definition and was um, presented uh, 2019 by uh, some of the people involved in the ICD-11 development. I'll come to this a little bit later. So the four points are basically including four important aspects. First, of course, chronic post-surgical pain should be related to a surgery. This is clear. However, it should be at least three months after surgery. So taking into account uh, some time of, um, uh, of uh, um, wound healing after surgery, we need the three months uh, to take before we talk about chronic post-surgical pain. The next one is, of course, clear as well. So it needs to be related to the area of the surgery or at least related to referred areas or dermatomes of the head so the third point is that, and this is a very difficult one, pre-existing conditions should be excluded. So if there is pain after surgery that is three months later still there, but was similar there before surgery, for example, due to a tumor, this is not included in the definition. However, if there is uh, pain before surgery, and this increases significantly three months after surgery. This still can be called uh, post-surgical chronic pain. And fourth, so, uh, and this is important, and we will see this later, that post-surgical pain might be of neuropathic mechanism. So you could be, you you could include this in the neuropathic pain conditions. However, what is emphasized by this group is that this should be an own entity. So post-surgical neuropathic pain is a, still a post-surgical entity. On the next slide, 
um, uh, there is an introduction of the idea, and this is actually, in fact, has been done already, uh, the ICD-11 classification. So this will be the next ICD classification, uh, includes chronic, post-surgical, and post-traumatic pain. So this new classification of chronic post-surgical pain in the ICD-11 classification will provide now a new diagnostic code for the most common chronic pain conditions after surgery, which you can see on the left side of this tree. The right side is uh, related to post-traumatic pain. And we will, uh, this will help to identify, diagnose, and hopefully study chronic post-surgical pain much better than what has been done before. On the next slide, um, I will introduce uh, uh, some numbers. So you might be um, curious about how many patients develop chronic pain after surgery. And this is, it was uh, related to pain out. Winfried introduced the pain out, um, the pain out uh, registry. And this was a study related to this pain out registry that has been done in 21 hospitals in Europe. And the main outcome here is that at 12 months, on the right side, you see the numbers, the incidence of moderate to severe pain was around 12%. At six months, on the left side, it was around 15%. So these are huge numbers just with moderate and severe pain. If you include all pains, like mild pain as well, there is, uh, the number is even higher, of course. Um, on the next slide, um, you will see that um, chronic pain after surgery uh, is related to the type of surgical procedure. So related, so if, if you have a thoracic or a breast surgery, this uh, relates to much higher incidence rates uh, compared to other types of surgical procedures. These data are from a very well done meta-analysis and uh, shows you very nicely differences uh, between the incidence rates. And um, in the same meta-analysis, on the right side you will in a second see that the same relates to the neuropathic pain component in chronic post-surgical pain. So after thoracic surgery, the percentage of patients with neuropathic pain in red is much higher uh, than, for example, after knee or hip surgery, uh, uh, which is basically around 10% or even less. So related to the type of the surgery, there is a difference with the components uh, of neuropathic pain. Uh, to this. And in, the, um, in a nice column uh, 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 presented recently by Stefan Schuck and a colleague, there are, uh, there's shown the different numbers related to chronic pain per se after surgery, after different surgical procedures. It's not showing up on my screen. Hopefully you can see that. And the neuropathic components of pain in the last column, which are very different uh, and in some uh, surgical procedure, procedures even not reported. On the next slide, um, uh, the numbers are uh, basically um, uh, the same from the European study again I'm showing you here and what in this European study has been as well um, recognized was that the functional impairment of patients with neuropathic pain was much higher. Uh, this you can see by the B BDI questions um, here in the, in the figure. Um, the patients with neuropathic pain are much more um, um, impaired uh, with, uh, with regard to general activity, enjoyment of life, mood, or other aspects. So no pathic pain is a real impact 
to the patients. And on the left, you can see that patients with neuropathic pain has usually more severe pain as well. So on the next slide, um, there um, uh, will be just a conclusion of, of my first uh, uh, part of the talk, uh, introducing the impact of chronic pain after surgery, introducing that patients after different surgical procedures have different kinds of pain and that no opacic and nociceptive no, uh, chronic pain after surgery needs to be uh, recognized. And as Winfried said already, patients with severe postoperative pain after surgery uh, are of major risk of developing chronic pain after surgery, which has been sh shown in many uh, studies uh, earlier. So if we talk about preventive treatment options for chronic pain after surgery, we need to briefly recognize the mechanism that, that are causing chronic pain after surgery. I will not bother you with any um, molecular aspects here, but I would like to just suggest a few clinical aspects. Like I said, acute severe pain after surgery, um, which is one aspect. But there are other clinical aspects and, as well, which are coming uh, 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 in a few seconds. These are opiates, high doses of opiates. These are surgeries with nerve injury. This is perioperative stress of the patient just mentioning a few of them. So by taking this into account and almost all of them are related to molecular mechanism, of course, and just to mention one because we will come to a preventive approach. Uh, these are NMDA receptor antagonists, uh, agon, uh, uh, receptors involved. These receptors will come in the next slides more, uh, will get more, um, um, will be more important to realize. So these factors are clinical factors, opioid stress, nerve injury, and severe acute, acute pain, where we uh, can already um, uh, contribute to mechanism. So talking about uh, preventive strategies now, in the next slide, um, you, will be, you will see the con conclusions of one nice Cochrane database meta-analysis. Basically showing you that after thoracotomy, breast cancer surgery, and C-sections, there are data available also with low or moderate quality evidence that regional anesthesia can prevent chronic post-surgical pain. So epidural anesthesia, there is a number needed to treat for a benefit out of seven. So you treat seven with an epidural, and in one, you prevent chronic pain after surgery. The odds ratio here is 0.52. Uh, for breast cancer surgery, again, 0.43. And the, for uh, C-section, it's 0.46. So all are in the same range, all are, um, are significant. They came out significant in this meta-analysis and as well continuous infusion with local anesthetics for iliac breast bone graft harvesting. So for this, for surgical procedures, there is some evidence that, um, uh, that regional anesthesia techniques are able to provide some benefit. What is with drugs? On the next slide, you can see some, um, one Cochrane analysis summarizing a number of studies and analyzing them separately for three, basically three drugs, ketamine, gabapentin, and pregabalin. And just to, um, to give an overview about this, the results of these three drugs. Um, uh, in the next slide, the results of ketamine are shown. And six months after surgery, uh, 
there is a reduction of the incidence of uh, chronic post-surgical pain if you treat patients with ketamine. On the left side of the slide, you can see that there is always one or two studies just for each type of surgical procedure. So it is not possible to provide any evidence for one certain surgical procedure. However, in, uh, in conclusion of all of these studies, there is a benefit and the number needed to treat for a benefit here is around 11 for six months after surgery. There's another nice meta-analysis that shows similar results. However, the results are a little bit more disturbing by showing you that if you study pain at rest and pain at movement or as it is here stated in motion, um, there is only a little effect early after surgery and only for pain at rest. Um, this is very important for the future, I think, that we differentiate these different types of outcome parameters and that we clearly state if the evidence we have is clinically relevant. So by putting all this data for ketamine together, there is, seems to be some evidence that ketamine has a benefit, but the benefit is clearly weak. Next slide shows you for gabapentin and pregabalin, the main outcomes left for gabapentin. And as you visualize already, there is no benefit of giving gabapentin perioperatively. On the right side, there is, seems to be effect for pregabalin to prevent three months after surgery some kind of uh, um, yeah, post-operative uh, chronic pain. However, this is driven by just one study, is the first study shown here. So the evidence is basically no, um, there's basically no real evidence that pregabalin prevents chronic pain after surgery in general. On the next slide, um, Jeanette, can you help me here? Yeah. There is one nicely later um, um, published study for Martinez, Valeria Martinez, uh, published this in 2017. And this study, in fact, shows that pregabalin is without any effect on general chronic pain after surgery. The difference here is that they included non-published data from trials that were basically negative, you know, of the uh, publication bias of negative studies. So this is why this study is even ne more negative than the Cochrane analysis. However, uh, Valeria um, um, made an analysis for uh, chronic pain uh, with, um, with no passive components. I put it here in red. After three months, there seems to be a benefit for neuropathic pain if you give pregabalin perioperatively. That seems to be somehow um, clear as uh, uh, identifying pregabalin as a treatment for chronic neuropathic pain. So it seems that here we have a drug that might be relevant for chronic neuropathic pain prevention um, specifically, but here we need more data. The evidence is very low and will not be confirmed at six months after. So the next slide shows you um, basically an, um, uh, the, the last uh, uh, drug, uh, just briefly, lidocaine IV. Winfried mentioned already that this helps to reduce opiate uh, consumption during surgery. And it seems from a few studies here published in 2018 from a meta-analysis that this is uh, somehow effective in preventing chronic post-surgical pain, at least after, after breast surgery, because most of the studies uh, have been uh, performed in breast surgical patients. So as a summary, in the, in the next slide, what we can conclude is that we have a number of studies investigating um, regional anesthesia techniques, and these studies seem to indicate some benefit of epidural and other regional anesthesia techniques, at least for some surgical procedures. The evidence for the drugs is low, 
um, there are some aspects not defined yet, yet, which is the dose, the duration of treatment that we need, and maybe a combination of drugs that should benefit. Um, Valeria Martinez did here a study that have been, uh, however, negative, and there's just another study published in anesthesiology, again, not showing a benefit of a combination. Regional anesthesia prevention, we don't know how long we need to do the regional anesthesia. Um, there is a study that um, uh, uh, shows uh, it's a very old study, 10 years ago, shows that individualization of the duration of regional anesthesia might be of benefit. However, um, this needs to be confirmed in randomized controlled studies. Combination of regional anesthesia techniques with drugs, there is from the meta-analysis of CLAT, an indication that epidural and ketamine might be together a benefit. And Patricia did very early studies here, and this is one example showing the same. However, the evidence is very low here, and there is no meta-analysis on combination yet. There are two aspects left, at least, here. One aspect I would like to mention is that quantification, um, as you have seen, is not relevant for all patients. So treat, treating a lot of patients, maybe all patients after surgery, would pay, put patients at risk that are not at risk really. So we need to predict those patients that are at high risk for getting, taken, for getting chronic pain after surgery. And the second approach is, the second aspect I would really like to emphasize is that I just took out here the period around the surgery. However, quantification means a biopsychosocial process. And probably this needs much more than drugs. And we need, and there are some nice studies, uh, not randomized controlled studies, however, but still one, some approaches of a transitional pain service and a biopsychosocial multidisciplinary approach that might be able to prevent and treat chronic pain after surgery um, in total. This is not yet defined, but I would like to mention that this might be a very interesting approach. So, Jeanette, if you can put my last slide on the, um, on the screen, which is not the next one, it's the over next one, the uh, one, one more. This just, you know, the one before, this just shows you the risk factors. And this was not the topic of this talk, but just to mention that there are risk factors for chronic pain after surgery. And we need much more work on this to identify patients that are at high risk preoperatively during surgery. Of course, nerve injury is here a very big topic, but time of, uh, uh, severe pain after surgery and signs of neuropathic pain after surgery to prevent pain, chronic pain in those patients that are at risk and not in those that are without any risk. So thank you for listening to this talk. My last slide just shows you the Global Year webpage. Janet, the next slide. And there is one fact sheet, number eight, and there are much more fact sheets on, the fa uh, on, this, uh, um, on this Global Year site. Uh, fact sheet number eight shows you all the evidence I showed you here for prevention with drugs and regional anesthesia techniques. Thank you very much. So this was the second talk. The last talk will be given by Dr. Melanie Noll. And I would like to introduce Melanie, uh, who is an associate professor of clinical psychology at the University of Calgary. 
And she's a full member of the Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute and the Hodgkin's uh, Wayne's Institute. She directs the Alberta Children's Pain Research Lab with the Be Little Pain and Rehabilitation Center at the Alberta Children's Hospital in Canada. Her expertise, Dr. Knoll's expertise, is on children's memories for pain and co-occurring mental health issues and pediatric chronic pain. She published a lot of studies uh, related to chronic pain in children, children's pain memory, and is very well recognized for her contribution to advancing knowledge of the psychological aspects of children's pain. Um, she won a number of uh, awards and she is um, well associated with ISP and other associations. So Melanie, thank you for, um, um, for providing us with a second, third topic here, uh, preventing pain after surgery in children. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm delighted to, um, to join um, uh, the panelists and also present uh, the pediatric side of this um, topic. Next slide, please. So um, it may surprise you that, you know, just 40 years ago, around the time that I was born, babies underwent surgery without any analgesic. It was widely believed that babies couldn't feel pain, and it was also believed that uh, infants couldn't remember pain. Next slide. We know now um, that this is not the case, um, that from the first days of birth, early pain experiences uh, have a lasting impression. Um, they're remembered implicitly, and as children develop and grow, uh, these explicit memories of painful experiences are laid down. And these memories set the stage for pain well into adulthood. And this is a picture of a preverbal infant. She can't talk uh, yet, but as soon as she enters a uh, doctor's office where she's previously uh, had a painful experience, she begins crying. She begins showing that she can anticipate pain. Uh, she's showing that she can remember it. And the mother here is asking the question, I think she remembers the last time, is that possible? And indeed it is. Next slide. Um, why is this important? Well, how children remember pain sets the stage for future pain and healthcare experiences well into adulthood. We're talking about surgery today, and that's going to be the focus of, of the work, but the early work in this area was really around needles and other kinds of acutely painful experiences. And it's been shown that how these early pain experiences are remembered can not only influence greater pain and distress at future painful experiences, but also avoidance of healthcare and phobias of healthcare as well. Next slide. Now, the interesting part about memory for pain and memory in general is that it's not like a tape recorder. You can't play back a painful experience and have it recounted exactly as it happened. Instead, we know that memories are highly fragile. They're susceptible to distortion. And about one in four children after a painful experience will develop what we call a negatively biased memory for pain. They'll remember the painful experience as being more painful and more scary than it actually was. So these memories are becoming increasingly distressing. Um, this is important because it's the kids that develop these negatively biased memories that then go on to develop problems with pain and more fears and avoidance in the future. So we're trying to understand which children are more likely to develop these negatively biased memories. We know that how procedures end, if a procedure uh, or a hospital experience ends positively, children are more likely to develop more accurate and positive memories of that painful experience. Girls are more at risk for developing negatively biased memories than boys, and anxiety could be a whole series, year of, of lectures that I, IASP could uh, put off. We know that anxious individuals, anxious children, and especially children of anxious parents are most at risk for developing negatively biased memories of pain. In fact, an anxious individual is more likely to remember what they expected would happen than what actually happened. Next slide. Now, why, why surgery? Well, 
we got very interested in understanding memory for post-surgical pain because it is, for two reasons, an ideal uh, model. Number one, we know that when we study memory, this is a salient single event. Um, and so it can be placed in time easier than repeated painful experiences. Um, also, about eight years ago, there was a lot of research coming out showing that in the pediatric population, among children undergoing major surgeries like spine fusion, pectus repair, um, up to 15 to 20 percent of these youth would go on four months to five years later to develop chronic post-surgical pain. And because chronic pain is so difficult to prospectively catch, um, this is an ideal model to understand factors like pain memory that may explain why pain transitions from an acute to a chronic state. Next slide. So we, uh, we published a paper to try to understand, and we embarked on a research program to understand whether memory was one mechanism that may underlie why post-surgical pain transitions from an acute to a chronic state. Next slide. And we demonstrated that um, by following uh, children undergoing these spine fusions and pectus repair, we assessed their anxiety and catastrophizing at baseline. They underwent the surgery, rated their pain, and at two, two to four months later, we asked them to remember their pain experience shortly after surgery and in the acute recovery stage um, using the pain, same pain scales previously administered. And then they rated their pain several months later. Next slide. And we found that indeed, how children remembered pain predicted higher pain at the time that it could transition from an acute to a chronic state. And this is controlling for all the, the culprits that you would think would be important, surgical factors, anesthetic use, um, you know, um, it was really over and above initial pain even that children who developed more negatively biased memories of pain, those children that remembered the surgery as being worse than it was, went on to experience higher pain at that time that it can transition to a chronic state. Next slide. Now this fascinated us and it made us rewind backwards in time because we believe that how pain is experienced early in life before the time of puberty when, when children are, are at risk for developing chronic pain, that those early painful experiences can really have a powerful impact on later pain experience. And we got interested in what I call the golden period of childhood. Children between the ages of four and six years old. It's a really powerful time where there's a lot of cognitive development that's happening. And from a memory perspective, it's interesting because this is a period of development where memories are incredibly fragile. In fact, there are source errors in that you could tell a child that something happened. And at that period of development, they can actually adopt it as if it's a memory of their own. And the power of parents and parent, child and adult language and these interactions is critical in influencing the memory. Next slide. So we got interested in tonsillectomies. These are routine surgeries that young children undergo often for sleep disordered breathing. And we followed, next slide, um, about 112 children four to seven year olds who were undergoing these uh, tonsillectomy surgeries. Um, we assessed their anxiety, their language, their sleep. Uh, they underwent their surgery. They rated their pain in the hospital and during the first two weeks at home. And then they came into the lab to talk to their parents, to reminisce with their parents as they normally would about the surgery. And then they rated their pain weeks later. So this allowed us to see the, the role that reminiscing and parent-child language and how we talk to our children may influence the development of biases in children's memories. Next slide. And indeed, we found that how children and parents reminisced about the surgery experience influenced how children remembered pain. Parents who talked to children in more elaborative ways, they asked more open-ended questions, they processed the emotional aspects of the experience, and parents and children who focused less on the actual pain sensations, 
those children then went on to develop more accurate and positive memories of that experience, showing how powerful language is in shaping those memories of surgery. Next slide. So I've argued that this is an unharnessed opportunity for intervention because memory is so fragile. This is another uh, intervention target that we could use to potentially buffer against the development of problems in the future. Next slide. So led by my um, brilliant uh, PhD student, Maria Pavlova, we developed a memory reframing intervention. This was based on interventions that had been used for uh, needle procedures that essentially um, involved talking to children after the painful experience and highlighting positive aspects and minimizing the painful aspects of the experience. And just simple uh, feedback that had been given to these children during needle procedures uh, had been shown to lead to more accurate and positive memories of those procedures. Next slide. So our intervention involved following the children who underwent those surgeries and teaching parents how to reminisce in more adaptive ways. This is very simple. It was a 15 minute intervention. And we basically um, told parents about the importance of, of talking about past painful experiences. We asked them to shine their spotlight of attention on anything positive about that experience. That could have been a friendly nurse. It could have been a positive interaction um, with someone after the surgery. It could have been someone helpful. It could have been a movie. It didn't matter. Anything positive that they could pull and talk about. Second, if parents noticed that children were negatively exaggerating how bad the experience it was, they would correct that exaggeration and show them it wasn't that bad. And finally, we helped parents identify and talk about anything that the child did that showed them that they had control over the pain experience. Next slide. We followed these about, uh, this was a, a randomized control trial. We followed 64 parent-child dyads. Next slide. They were all undergoing these tonsillectomy procedures. Um, two weeks after um, the procedure, they came back to the lab and were randomized to either receive the pain memory reframing intervention or a control group where they were taught how to play with their child. Then they completed the memory interview. Next slide. And indeed, in just this 15 minutes of instruction, that led parents in the intervention group to use these strategies while reminiscing with their children. And the children in the intervention group developed more accurate and positive memories of their post-surgical pain experience, both in terms of their pain intensity, next slide, and their pain-related fear. So children receiving these interventions, uh, this intervention uh, went on to remember the painful surgical experience as being less scary and less painful. Next slide. So this is my last um, slide to give you a future direction. We are very excited about these, the success of this intervention and we want to roll this out more broadly. But we're also partnering with neuroscientists. This is my former postdoc and new PI, uh, Jill Vanal, uh, who showed that not only in terms of explicit memories are there differences when pain becomes problematic, but the memory region of the brain, the hippocampus, is different in children with chronic pain versus children without chronic pain. Their hippocampal volumes are smaller. Next slide. And the connections between the hippocampus to the amygdala and the connectivity to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is different. We just received a large grant to follow uh, adolescents undergoing spine fusion, pectus repair, orthopedic surgeries to look at the changes in the memory region of the brain as pain transitions from an acute to a chronic state, and also to pair these changes in the brain uh, with actual changes in behavior and their explicit reports and memories of pain. Next slide. I'd just like to thank my lab and thank you for inviting me to share this research. I'd be very happy to, to chat with anyone after and welcome any questions. Okay, thank you so much for all of our presentations today. Um, I don't know if the panelists have time to answer any other questions. I see some were being answered um, as the other presentations were going on, so thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions on Melanie's presentation um, that I would like to get to. Um, 
just since we just finished her presentation. Um, so one of these questions is, what would you suggest to tackle the development of negatively biased memories? Um, would this differ between newborns, younger children, and older children? And should you keep using these techniques during each painful procedure? Or would it be sufficient only for very young children? Great question. And I also saw that someone else commented that these strategies could be used on adults as well, and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, when we talk about pre-verbal children and memory in infancy uh, and before children can talk, uh, we're really talking about implicit memory, so uh, um, sort of non-conscious memories. Um, when we talk about memory from that perspective, we're really looking at pharmacological, non-pharmacological strategies to really manage pain to prevent the sensitization and the implicit memory formation. Um, and I should say that proper and aggressive pain management in the acute period is also critically important because uh, acute pain predicts memory for pain. So this is very important. But if I had to put my money on the biggest predictor, and this is based on empirical evidence from our lab, Joel Katz's lab, Jennifer Rabbit's lab, um, it would show that managing preoperative anxiety of parents and children uh, is, is really going to get us very far in preventing pain problems, but also preventing buffering against the development of negatively biased memories. And so we published a paper last year really documenting, documenting the importance of um, anxiety before surgery and in the first you know, three days in hospital. The more aggressively we can uh, target and treat anxiety, um, the less problems we'll have with memory and post-surgical pain. So really we need to be approaching the before, the during, and the after anxiety, pain management, and memory for pain. Okay, great. And so one other question we had um, was whether there's a variation in the connectivity as a result of conditioning. Um, okay, so, so I will say that, the, that the, um, the last two slides I presented are, are based on small pilot data. And they're also based on children who have uh, chronic migraine versus no chronic pain. So really, um, there, to my knowledge, there have been no imaging studies of pediatric surgical pain. Um, so, you know, it would be, it's a bit of a leap to um, make assumptions based on um, these other chronic pain conditions. That was enough for us to hypothesize that indeed the hippocampus may be involved in the transition from acute to chronic pain, uh, uh, from an acute to a chronic state. Um, however, we really need to collect this data uh, to answer that question. I don't want to speculate. Great, thank you so much. So we just have one more question that I think will probably be to Esther. Um, what doses of ketamine are you using for acute pain management in high-risk acute pain patients, and how regularly are you dosing, and are you, dose, are you using that post-operatively? Yeah, that's a good question, and um, I can say first that the um, um, review I mentioned is very heterogeneous in the amount of ketamine they are giving. So uh, even um, the timing um, by starting in the in the early phase and going um, uh, towards the post-operative phase is very, very different. So um, if we use ketamine, in fact, I'm not using uh, it um, a lot perioperatively. What I'm doing a lot, or at least some time is, I start the infusion of ketamine after surgery in patients with high opioid uh, uh, use before surgery. And we start in the um, in the PACO already um, uh, without doing um, uh, without doing uh, bolus. We use um, a continuous infusion weight of 0.5 microgram per kilogram per minute. So um, um, we uh, started very low, and then we um, start to balance it for side effects and for effects. So what we are doing is uh, time and dose uh, dependent on uh, what I want. So I usually do it for opioid reduction and I usually do it um, 
uh, individualized after starting it. However, some people do it already before surgery and they put an uh, uh, 0.5 uh, milligram per kilogram bolus on and then they start uh, an infusion or even they don't. So some use just a bolus before surgery and uh, nothing at the end. And in fact, there is no evidence uh, saying that anything is better than the other. Um, yeah. Okay, and great. I, so I think we're actually over our time here, unfortunately. I know there's a lot of great questions coming in, so um, I might work with the presenters in order to answer these questions and then make them available online um, with the recording. Um, and if that does happen, you will receive an email um, letting you know that that's available. I want to thank everyone for attending today, and I want to say that our next webinar in the Global Year series will be on uh, two weeks from today on physiotherapy for pain prevention. So I hope everyone um, that attended today will also be interested in attending that um, webinar as well. And if you are, you can find information about that on our Global Year webpage on the IASP website. Um, thank you all for attending today, and I really look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.